Welcome back adventurers. Looking at my map, it's starting to look pretty okay, but right now we have a whole lot of black lines and not a lot of everything else. So how do you know where to put a jungle or a desert? Why do some places get a ton of rain while others are dry as bone? Well, today we're gonna go over the how, the why, all of it. So let's talk biomes. Before we can think about jungles or deserts, we have to talk about wind because wind controls where rain falls, where dry air settles down and where storms hit the hardest. All right, so imagine the earth as a giant spinning ball, because it is, with a warm band around the center, the equator, and it has cold tops and bottoms. Those are the poles. Well, warm air rises and cold air sinks. We just know this. Think about a hot air balloon, right? You heat the air and it makes the balloon go up. Well, when air gets heated by the sun, mostly near the equator because that's where most of the sun is hitting, it becomes lighter and it rises. And when air cools down, mostly near the poles, it gets heavier and it sinks. And you can see this in action with fog. It's the same reason hot and humid areas get so much rain. Because as the moisture in the air gets heated up, it rises, it creates clouds, and then it drops all of that rain. Air also moves from high to low pressure. So if you have a full balloon, for example, and you let go of the opening, air rushes out super fast. We see this all the time. This is because air naturally moves from areas with lots of air pressure, like a full balloon, to areas with low air pressure, like the empty space outside the balloon. It just flows out. And then the last thing to consider with wind for the sake of this video anyways, is the rotation of the planet. The Earth spins which makes the wind curve. Because as it moves up, the location that it was moving to has now shifted because the earth is always spinning and this messes with how air moves. So instead of going straight from the equator to the poles, the air gets pushed to the side. This is called the Coriolis effect. It's a weird little twist basically. And since warm air rises at the equator, cooler air from nearby moves in to take its place. And this is how we get wind. Okay, but lore, this is a video about fantasy maps. Why the f do I feel like I'm in grade school again? Well, because of all this movement, Earth has wind patterns. You have the trade winds, you have the westerlies, you have the polar easterlies. And these winds help control the weather by moving storms and clouds around the globe. They also help ocean currents move, which affects temperatures, it affects climate. And that's why we need to know this. So shut the f up and sit down, Timmy. All of that to say that basically air moves because of the sun heating different parts of the Earth unevenly and also because of the pressure differences and because of the earth spinning. That's what creates wind. Whew, okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's start with something simple, jungles. Now, assuming you have a hospitable world with an atmosphere that can host life, jungles really just need two things. They need heat and they need rain, lots of rain. Now, in most worlds, hot air rises near the equator and as it cools, it creates clouds that form these massive rainstorms that drop tons of water. That means jungles usually form around the middle of the world in a band near your equator. So if you want a jungle on your map, put it somewhere warm and somewhere that gets a ton of water. And what's cool is that you can actually see this on Earth. This area on the equator is called the tropical rain belt or the intertropical convergence zone or the ITCZ. But don't worry about that fancy name. All you need to know is that this is where the warm air rises, it cools, and then it drops a ton of rain. Because the sun hits this part of the world the strongest, the air there heats up, it absorbs moisture from the ocean, rises into the atmosphere, and as it rises and cools, it forms these massive clouds, and where there's water, there's life, which is why rainforests cover this area in thick, endless greenery and so many diverse different types of animals and ecosystems. Now, just beyond the jungles is our next biome, where rain is still present but less frequent, savannas. Savannas, or also known as temperate grasslands, are vast grasslands with scattered trees. They are shaped by seasonal rainfall. So they aren't as wet as a rainforest, but they still get enough moisture to sustain life, just not all year round. Instead, savannas have very distinct wet and dry seasons where you'll get things like monsoons or sudden floods, heavy rainstorms at specific times of the year. So if you think about the African Serengeti, it's hot, it has long stretches of dry months followed by bursts of rain. So you'll find herds of grazing animals, you'll find them moving from water to water source, you'll find a lot of predator-prey relationships since a lot of animals are trying to survive for long periods of time, and trees that grow far apart instead of forming dense canopies. If you want to add savannas to your map, place them between your jungles and your deserts. We haven't talked about those yet, we'll get there in a second, where there's still rain around, but not enough to support a thick tropical forest. These regions make for really great settings for things like nomadic cultures, for massive migrations of animals or people if you really want to have like a cool uh, tribal or nomadic group of people or a culture that moves with the animals. And there's lots of open landscapes where you ha might have history of battles that were fought under the skies or whatever. Now we get to something a little more complex. Once all of that rain falls, the air keeps moving, but now it's dry. And that brings us to our next biome, deserts. That dry air moves north and south. It sinks back down to the surface and sinking air doesn't make clouds or rain. Instead, it creates these dry zones. It sucks moisture out of the air. And that's why most major deserts on Earth, like the Sahara, the Arabian Desert, the Australian Outback, they sit right beyond the jungles. If you want a hot desert, put it in a sunny, low altitude region with 
very little water. If you want a cold desert, you put it farther north or on a high altitude plateau like the Gobi Desert. But deserts don't just happen in hot places. Some deserts form because of mountains blocking the rain. This is called a rain shadow. And how rain shadows work is that wind blows moist air towards a mountain range. The air rises, it cools, and it drops all of this rain on the windward side, which is the wet side. This is usually the side that faces the ocean where most of that moisture is coming from. By the time the air reaches the other side of the mountains as it's going up and over, it's completely dry because it's dropped all of its water on the side of the mountain that it just came from. So as the air crosses to the other side of the mountains, it's now dry. This creates a desert or a dry grassland behind the mountains. And you can see this in California especially. You have these really lush forested areas on the windward side of the Sierras, but right on the other side is the dry arid desert on the leeward side and Vegas. Now as you go farther north, you start to get colder because most planets don't get even sunshine on all areas. In fact, the tilt of the Earth is why we have seasons. As the Earth wobbles for some of the year, we're facing the sun, and for some of the year, we're facing just a little bit away. That little bit of wobble is enough to cause a shift in, say, a few degrees of temperature, and that's where we get our ups and downs and our fluctuations in our temperatures, and that's where we get our summers and our winters. Now just beyond the deserts, as the air warms up again and starts carrying more of that moisture away, we get our next biome, which is our temperate forests. Now, if you really want to make your campaign a delight, you need Describe. Now, instead of talking to you about it, I decided it's probably better just to show you. So here's 30 seconds of ambient sounds brought to you by Describe. Don't skip. It's good for you. Now, temperate forests have a more balanced rainfall, meaning they don't rely on things like monsoons or seasonal floods like a savanna does to sustain its plant life. Instead, they get this steady supply of rain throughout the year, which allows a variety of trees to thrive. Now, on Earth, you have two types of temperate forests. There's your deciduous forests, which are those forests that shed their leaves in the fall and they regrow them in the spring. So this is where you get forests like what we have in Europe or in the eastern US. You get lots of rolling forests where autumn, you know, creates these really beautiful fiery reds and oranges on the landscape. Then you have your evergreen forests. And these forests keep their, their leaves year round and they thrive in cooler, rainier climates. So if you think of the Pacific Northwest, you have these towering conifers or the black forest in Germany that is dense with fir and spruce. These trees are adapted to those drier periods. So if you want to add a temperate forest to your map, put them between your deserts and your next biome, the taiga. Now, remember those wind patterns? Well, as you go farther north, winds change their direction back and forth. You can see it here on Earth in this diagram here. So you get a sort of roller coaster. The air rises, heads north, then falls, then warms again and heads north into the colder areas, then releases rain and falls, heading north again, and it does this until it reaches the pole. Now in these areas where wind rises and cools, dropping steady rain is where we get our next biome, taigas. These are forested areas, usually cold for long periods of time. Winters here are long, they're dark, and they're snowy because you're farther up north where you're getting less sunlight. Trees also tend to be very tall because they're trying to reach more sunlight. They're thin evergreens because they can survive these cold and limited sunlight areas. Now in these forested taigas, you'll have a lot of diverse life that is adapted to these cold and, and harsh environments. So it creates a lot of room for you to come up with some unique fantasy uh, animals to, to try and fill in some of that ecosystem in your fantasy world, which I think is why taigas to me are some of the most fascinating biomes in the world, because while it looks like there's nothing going on, there's actually a lot of, e there's a lot of animals that are adapted to this area that are just very good at hiding. Now, as I said earlier, the taiga does get some rain. So as the moisture gets dropped, the air falls again as it cools and it moves north. And that's where we get our last biome, the tundra or our frozen wastes. The reason for this is because as we go north, temperatures drop. The cold air can't hold much moisture, so it stays dry. And dry and cold means inhospitable for the most part. So tundras are these really intense areas where very little life has adapted to these environments. They have no trees. Usually there's only moss or shrubs and there's a lot of permafrost. And then at the farthest edge of your map, right beyond that is your ice caps. These places get very little precipitation, making them essentially just frozen deserts. Now, with all of that said, of course, this is a fantasy map making video, so we don't have to follow the rules exactly. If you want a jungle in the far north, then just say that there's this weird volcano that's heating the land around it with its crazy vents, or there's a magical ley line. 
If you want a desert in the middle of a jungle, maybe it's because of some weird curse. You get to take these rules and bend them. And that's kind of the fun part of fantasy maps. Now, if something feels off on your map and you, you just don't feel like it feels realistic enough, ask yourself, where's the air moving to? Has the rain already fallen somewhere else? Is there magic or a historical event that's causing these changes? Now, I understand that for some people, none of that info really helps, at least not if you're visual like me. So let's take a look at my own world, Maladea. Now, some things to know about Maladea, my fantasy world, is that it's not a planet. Maladea is actually a moon and it's tidally locked. So the same side of the moon always faces the planet, just like the Earth's moon. Why does that matter, you ask? Timmy, you interrupt a Well, because without rotation, we don't get the Coriolis effect. This means Maladea doesn't have the same wind patterns. In fact, Maladea experiences temperature fluctuations as it slowly turns from day to night over the course of about a week. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is because I think it's a really good opportunity to look at how different places can form different biomes. So anyways, during the day, the planet warms up, it gets lots of rain, and then as the sun sinks over the next few days, daytime and nighttime on Maladea each last about 300 hours. It starts to get colder. Now, the planet that it's orbiting actually gives off heat and radiation, which helps keep things nice and hospitable during most of the year. But the winters can become really extreme, and these are all things that I had to consider when building my world. With all of that said, let's take a look at its biomes. Based on what I know, I know that Maladea's biomes will be shaped a little bit differently because the wind isn't moving the way that it does on Earth. So as the sun rises slowly, air warms up, and over the course of a week, you get lots of rain. And where the warm air was, since it's now a vacuum, cold air rushes in and it creates winds. So the early part of the day on Maladea is usually very windy and wet. Then as the long day starts to give way to twilight over the course of the next 300 hours, air cools and with less heat, those massive storm cells that were created during the day lose a lot of their energy and break apart into weaker scattered storms. And in areas where moisture is still present, like your coasts, your lakes, your mountaintops, those are gonna get some low-lying clouds, you're gonna get some fog, you might get some mist, since the cooling air can no longer hold as much of the water vapor as it's released much of that and it's starting to cool and fall to the ground. Now in drier regions on Maladea, this transition between day to night as things cool down can trigger dust storms as that wind, those high winds sweep across the landscape and carry over loose debris. On oceans, you might get remnants of these storms that drift towards the last remaining pockets of heat and start to form these slow moving storm fronts at that transition zone between day and night. So looking at my map, I know that I want an area of green around the equator because it's still the area that sticks out the most. So it's going to get the most sun and warmth. Now, dry areas on Maladea don't exist very much because overall it's a humid place thanks to the natural warmth that the planet Alterian gives off. But we still get rain shadows and the occasional dry region, so I can drop in a few deserts. And you can see what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm taking the original map that I drew in Incarnate and I'm using it sort of as a reference point. Um, and it's interesting because I actually put in these biomes without having that as reference. I actually, I don't know how the layer got deleted. But I brought it back in and you can see that my thought process is kind of the same, like most of those biomes aligned, aligned and uh, I made some changes here and there, but you can see really what I'm doing is I'm sort of referencing my original information, knowing where my mountains are going to be using the tectonics, the plate tectonics that I drew way back when, and using the wind direction that I know goes from left to right uh, as the moon orbits and as it rotates. Um, and so I use that as sort of my guide to know where where winds are being brought in from the poles towards, so they're going to come from the south and up north, and from the north down south, and they're sort of going in a right-ish direction, so I know that most of the rain and the storms are going to be forming on the left side and moving into the right because they're following that wind direction, so I know that when I'm looking at things like the jungles, uh, I can just... I can just sort of paint in places where I think there's going to be a little more moisture just based on the stuff that we're drawing and just using that as sort of a reference point. But overall, I am I am pretty happy with the way this looks and I think this does sort of follow a, a more realistic uh, viewpoint, I guess, for a fantasy map and that's kind of what I was going for and obviously I'm not a scientist, uh, as I've said in other videos, and this isn't perfect, but I think that it's a, it's a really good starting point and already kind of gives it a little bit more of a of a touch of realism, which is what I was hoping I would get. Um, and that's just how I do it. Obviously, there's a lot of different ways for people to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and finish this uh, and, and do this on my own time, and we'll see what this looks like uh, and as I start to fill in the mountains and add more of the rivers on the bottom half and take other things into consideration. Just really start to flesh this out before going in and starting to drop those, those things like those cities and, and countries and things like that. So. so anyways, that's sort of a quick rundown of biomes and how they fit into my world. 
I'm gonna finish this up and next time we'll start talking about countries and cities and adding them to your map. Let me know in the comments down below what's the coolest biome that you've ever created for your world. Is there something unique that you come up with that doesn't exist on our world? I would love to hear about it, so let me know. Mike Conney 2270 says, Tobias spotted 1945, great video. Big fan of the channel here. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Always love to hear the kind words. Zoe Kemp 2134 says, I dread the idea of being a full-time DM as I have never had the chance to really be a full uh, to really to really be a player, but I do love world building, so I am torn. Well, Zoe, you know what? When I feel the exact same way. I've always been sort of the go-to DM for my group. And I've learned to think of it in a different way. Instead of thinking of it as I've never gotten to play a character, what it means is that all of the cool characters you've ever thought of, you can put into your games as NPCs. Mario's Constantinitis 2685 says, This is such useful advice. I've been a writer and a DM for almost a decade now. And this streamlined approach, because of my scattered brain, always eludes me. And I start to hyperfixate on every single detail, so my process seems too hard, chaotic, and time-consuming to the people around me. And I can't get them to pick up DMing or writing for themselves, but this is a video I'm going to show my fiancé, that's amazing, and make a date out of this so we can start building her world together. That sounds like an incredible time. Uh, I love having a support system. I have my wife as my support system, so amazing that you can turn to somebody like that and help build something together and also just really honored that you would choose to do that for with one of my videos so um, thank you so much I really really appreciate that now if you were paying attention in today's video leave a comment with a timestamp down below with where you saw our little buddy Tobias in this video and you just might get shouted out in the next video as always thank you so much for watching for John my friends and we'll see you next time adventurers